Okay, so here we're going to talk about some of the lower yield stuff for the USMLE. Um, I'm just going to kind of cover this uh, in brief detail. I don't want to go too much into this because this is some of the stuff you just need to understand the periphery of. As far as the USMLE is concerned, you might not even get questions on these things, but they do pop up sometimes. So um, you really just need to understand these in, in sort of... Uh, sort of superficial uh, amounts. You don't need to understand these as much as the other things that we spent more time on. Okay, so these are the other diseases that we're gonna cover. And we'll talk about fungal, bacterial, viral, and parasitic diseases. So we'll start out with fungal infections. So we're gonna talk about aspergillosis, blastomycosis, and coccidiomycosis. These are all lung diseases. Um, but uh, they can manifest dermatologically as well. We're not going to talk about histoplasmosis. That's actually something we're going to focus on in the pulmonary section. So as far as all of the fungal lung infections, they're all pretty rare. The suspicion is going to be raised in immunocompromised patients as well as in immunocompetent patients with prolonged flu-like symptoms. And any patient that has flu-like symptoms as, as well as a rash and uh, skin manifestations that aren't responsive to therapy. So this includes, as we mentioned, aspergillosis, blastomycosis, and coccidiomycosis. So aspergillosis is a fungal disease that is only seen in the immun immunosuppressed. So you will not see aspergillosis in uh, healthy patients. This is going to be uh, in patients with HIV, patients on chronic steroids, patients with any kind of congenital or acquired neutropenia, patients who are, have cancer and are on chemotherapy. The cause of this is uh, any of the species in the, uh, in the genus Aspergillus, but most primarily it's Aspergillus fumigatus, which is widespread in nature. The symptoms are going to depend on the manifestation. So here you have one fungus, but there's multiple different manifestations. And it varies. You can have uh, just a simple allergic-like reaction to the aspergillum, or you could have a, a totally invasive disease. And as you can imagine, the symptoms are going to vary. So uh, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, the symptoms are going to be asthma-like. So. Here what you have is you inhale the uh, aspergilla spores and what happens is you have an immune reaction to them and you get bronchopulmonary constriction. And so this is going to manifest just like asthma. But we have to consider this in patients that are immunosuppressed. Asthma doesn't just up and develop. So the patients that are immunosuppressed who develop asthma-like symptoms, aspergillosis is a possibility. So as, asthma-like symptoms, dyspnea, cough, fever, and wheezing are signs of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. The mycetoma is a, uh, it's just like a fungal ball, and uh, this can also be referred to as an aspergilloma. And this can be asymptomatic. It could be a coincidental finding, like say you get a chest x-ray and you see a uh, a lesion or what, what I'll show you is like a halo like lesion on chest x-ray that can be uh, due to aspergillosis. When this presents however it presents as hemoptysis and so why would this present as hemoptysis? Think of the mycetoma as the fungal ball as just like any other cavitary lesion. So think of it like tuberculosis. How does tuberculosis generally present? It presents as hemoptysis. So when aspergillosis presents as a fungal ball, as an aspergilloma or a mycetoma, which are all the same thing, it presents as hemoptysis when it presents symptomatically. Invasive pulmonary aspergillosis is the most severe presentation of aspergillosis, but it primarily just presents as a fever, cough, and dyspnea that progressively gets worse and worse and worse, and you would have respiratory compromise in these patients. So any patient with fever and cough 
or any patient with hemoptysis should get a chest x-ray. That's regardless of whatever you think it is. So fever and a cough could be, could be any cause of pneumonia. And hemoptysis, we think of uh, tuberculosis, we think of uh, lung cancer, we think of uh, aspergil uh, aspergillum. So uh, any of these patients should be getting a chest x-ray. And that actually happens to be the best initial diagnostic test for any patient that we suspect aspergillosis anyway. However, a CT scan is going to be more accurate, and, and that makes perfect sense because you get a, a much better image with your CT than you get with just a two-dimensional chest x-ray. Routine labs are also going to be necessary, but these will generally be given to you on USMLE Step 2. On Step 3, you'll have to, you'll have to order them in the simulated cases. Sputum culture is going to be the most accurate because it's only by culture that we'll be able to actually see the fungus uh, or any pathogen. Uh, we won't be able to see that on imaging. As far as diagnosis, all diagnoses are going to require a positive sputum culture for confirmation of aspergillosis. Imaging alone is not sufficient. Uh, when we're talking about diagnosing invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, you're going to actually need to perform a lung biopsy to confirm that diagnosis. So for the, uh, for, for the allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, the, uh, of course the sputum culture is going to be needed for confirmation, but uh, your labs will show eosinophilia on your CBC, Bronchiectasis will be seen on your chest x-ray or CT, and that's just, again, like in any patient with, uh, with, with a asthmatic-like disease. Mycetoma, clearly you're going to see uh, the, the, uh, the, the ball on your chest x-ray or on your CT. I'll show you what that looks like. It really, it's just a solid mass with an air halo surrounding it. And then for the invasive disease, you're going to need a positive lung biopsy for diagnosis. So you can see here how this is one fungus, but it's three different manifestations. These are three separate diseases. They all, however, will only occur in immunocompromised patients. Uh, aspergillosis just simply is not on the radar in immunocompetent patients. So this is the mycetoma. Uh, so here you can see in the left lung field, you've got this fungal ball and it's surrounded by sort of a halo of air and then it's kind of walled off here. And then here you see it much more clearly, it's more obvious. I mean, this is, this is definitely definitive here, but sometimes it takes a CT to diagnose it. Sometimes you might not see it, it might be a little smaller on the chest x-ray. So a chest x-ray is the best initial test but as far as most accurate for imaging the mycetoma, it's a CT. So the treatment for aspergillosis, if it's the allergic disorder, uh, then you can use oral corticosteroids. Do not use the inhaled corticosteroids because that may worsen the disease. So you'll use oral cortic corticosteroids like prednisone. For mycetoma, you're gonna have to remove that surgically and for the invasive disease, you're going to use an antifungal, and that tends to be voriconazole. So what's important here is that even though these are all fungal diseases, only the invasive disease gets the antifungal. The other two we treat uh, in, in, in a different manner. Okay, blastomycosis. So this is something that yours truly has uh, intimate experience with. I actually got blastomycosis myself when I was 18 years old. Uh, so this is a fungal lung disease and the non-immunosuppressed. So if you remember me, you'll remember that. The culprit here is blastomyces dermatitidis, and this is most common in the central and southeastern U.S. The symptoms are flu-like syndromes, so fever, myalgias, cough, chest pain, weight loss, and those are really rather nonspecific. But what will be specific in blastomycosis is the skin manifestations, and these are sharply demarcated papules and pustules. They get bigger and they tend to ulcerate, uh, and they're actually pretty painful. So even though this is a fungal lung disease, you really don't see 
the lung manifestations, the pulmonary manifestations, as prominent as in the aspergillosis. And that's for two reasons, uh, but primarily because it's in the non-immunosuppressed patient. So they're, they're not getting pneumonia-like symptoms, and this is not going to become invasive. Um, let's see, what was I going to tell you? Uh, okay, so... How, the way you're going to diagnose this is with sputum microscopy. And you can either get microscopy of the sputum or you can get microscopy of the other fluids. And by the other fluids, what I mean is like the, uh, the pus or the fluid from the, uh, from the, the pustules uh, on, on the skin. And in general, sputum microscopy is is much more reliable in the fungal diseases. And the reason for this is because we don't have a flora, a natural flora of fungus in our, in our uh, respiratory tract. So microscopy is, is pretty reliable, or culture are pretty reliable, either or. But the best initial diagnostic step will be sputum microscopy or culture. Uh, generally, you'll get both at the same time. Now, Treatment is going to depend on clinical severity. So if the patient has severe disease, uh, let's say they are immunosuppressed, because an immunosuppressed patient can get blastomycosis, then if, if they've got severe disease, they've got severe uh, skin manifestations, uh, severe fever, then you can give them amphotericin B. And this is actually going to be a long uh, duration of therapy. It's going to be about 8 to 12 weeks of amphotericin B. Now, the reason amphotericin B is given for severe cases, yes, it is more effective, but it also has a side effect profile. And we want to avoid that side effect profile if we can. So while amphotericin B tends to be more effective, the side effect profile tends to cause us to reserve it for severe cases. In most cases, when you see blastomycosis, you're going to be giving an azole antifungal, and that's either itraconazole or ketoconazole. You'll be giving this to patients, and it will be oral, and they'll be on this for about a year. So it's quite a long time. So this is the kind of lesion that you'll see in patients with blastomycosis. And so if you see these lesions in addition to flu-like syndrome, then blastomycosis should be something that's on your radar. And these will be, you may see one or two of them, or you may see multiple throughout the body. But the patient will tend to present with this rather than the flu-like symptoms, because the flu-like symptoms can be anything. So usually for blastomycosis, the test is going to have to tell you that they've got these skin-like lesions, and they're really just these ulcerative lesions. Okay, so coccidioidomycosis is another fungal lung disease that happens in the non-immunosuppressed. Of course, it can happen in the immunosuppressed. Any of these diseases can happen in the immunosuppressed, uh, but this happens in the non-immunosuppressed as well. The culprit here is coccidioides immatis, and this is endemic to the U.S. Southwest. So that's going to be the dead giveaway. Either this patient's going to live in Arizona, New Mexico, California, Texas, or they are going to uh, have recently visited there. Again, the symptoms are this flu-like syndrome where you've got fever and cough and chest pain, weight loss, uh, body aches, uh, and it, this can be uh, added to arthralgias, so joint-like pain, uh, meningeal symptoms can happen here. You can actually get an invasion of coccidioides into the meningeal space. And the skin manifestations of coccidioides is erythema nodosum. And what erythema nodosum is, is it's just inflammation of these of, of, of the fat spaces, and it usually presents on the legs, which is where we have a lot of fat. Um, and it looks like just sort of these welts. So for diagnosis, the best initial diagnostic step is serology. However, if the patient presents with meningeal symptoms, then we're going to want to get a lumbar puncture. So meningeal symptoms, we're more concerned about meningitis, because that's more common. And so excluding an elevated intracranial pressure, we're going to go right for the lumbar puncture. 
Now, the lumbar puncture in the presence of coccidiomycosis will be, uh, it'll be a, uh, an elevated protein, it'll be a normal uh, to elevated glucose, um, so you'll, you'll have more of a viral or fungal picture rather than a bacterial picture. The best, okay, so the, uh, as I mentioned, the best initial diagnostic step is ser serology as long as you don't have meningeal symptoms. So how do we treat this? The question is actually not so much how do we treat this, but whether we treat it or not. Now, a patient can present with coccidiomycosis, and if they just have the flu-like symptoms uh, or meningeal symptoms, and let's say that they're not immunocompromised, we really don't necessarily need to treat the patient. If the patient is immunocompromised, if they're older, if they have comorbidities like diabetes, uh, or if they're pregnant, then we should definitely treat them or observe them closely. So in the case of severe disease, or if the patient is in the second or third trimester of pregnancy, then we're going to use ketoconazole or amphotericin B preferring ketoconazole because of its side effect profile. If the patient's in their first trimester of pregnancy, then we're going to prefer close observation. And the reason is because any of the azole antifungals, as well as amphotericin B, have uh, side effects for the fetus. And you can actually get uh, dysmorphous in, uh, or dys, uh, dysmorphosis in, in the fetus. They can get face defects and limb defects. So in the first trimester, we do not want to give uh, the pregnant woman antifungals. We prefer to observe her closely. And if it continues on into the second or third trimester, well then in the second trimester, we can actually begin therapy if we need to. Now, the exception to this is if she has meningeal symptoms. In the case of meningeal symptoms, we can give her amphotericin B intrathecally. And intrathecally, that will not go to the placenta. So that's actually okay. We don't have to worry about that. So if she's in the first trimester, we observe her. Intrathecally, we can give her amphotericin B if she has meningeal symptoms. But otherwise, this is something we just closely observe. Even in pregnant patients, while it may be more severe than in, in, in other patients, this is not something that tends to be life-threatening. So we're more concerned about the fetus than we are about the coccidioidomycosis. Uh, but if, if uh, like I said, if the meningeal symptoms are present, then we can actually go ahead with an intrathecal treatment. Okay, uh, some bacterial infections here. Uh, we're going to talk about toxic shock syndrome, which actually I struggled on whether or not I wanted to put that in the dermatologic section, but I decided to put it in here. We're going to talk about Q fever, uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and tetanus. So toxic shock syndrome is an acute life-threatening uh, toxin-mediated disease, and it's associated with tampon use most commonly, surgical wounds, and surgical procedures. So really, though, the what you should remember is the tampon use because that's how the USMLE likes to present it. So most commonly this is caused by staph aureus because it actually causes the production of a toxin known as toxic shock syndrome toxin, but occasionally it can be caused by staphylococcus pyogenes. The history in these patients are gonna be recent surgery or a recent delivery. Uh, or the use of highly absorbent tampons. Back in the 1980s, there was a highly absorbent tampon that came out before we knew about the, the connection between toxic shock syndrome and tampons. And actually, it turned out that this particular brand of tampons was associated with a high amount of, of toxic shock syndromes. So remember the, the tampon correlation. The symptoms are going to be pain at the source site, which could be the wound or it could be uh, the cervix, fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So you have a patient that's got sort of nonspecific symptoms. What you do want to know, though, is 
the desquamative rash on the hands and feet. That is pretty specific for toxic shock syndrome. So when you have a patient that's got a history of recent surgery or a history of tampon use and they've got this desquamative rash uh, in addition to maybe a history or a presence of fever, then you should be thinking toxic shock syndrome and you should be, uh, you should be treating them empirically. Hypotension is sort of the ominous sign that we prefer not to see. We don't like it to get that far. So when there's hypotension in addition to these symptoms, then we're really, really concerned. We diagnose this clinically. Generally, this presents as a disease that needs to be treated right away. So we don't want to be wasting our time with cultures or... Uh, toxin assays or anything like that. We diagnose toxic shock syndrome clinically. The treatment is going to be, if the patient has hypotension, of course we're going to be giving them fluid resuscita resuscitation. So remember your ABCs first. Hypotension warrants immediate fluid resuscitation. After that, we're going to give them immediate IV treatment with a semi-synthetic penicillin, and that's because those are uh, are useful against Staphylococcus aureus. So we're not going to be using penicillin here. We're going to be using oxacillin or nafcillin IV. The removal of the source or surgical debridement is also useful here. So obviously taking that tampon out, which is the source of the, the disease, or surgical debridement of the wound will be useful as well because we want to get rid of the source. So getting rid of the source treating the, the, the disease, uh, those are, are, are two steps in actually treating the toxic shock syndrome. But of course, fluid resuscitation is always our first step if the patient is hypotensive. And this is uh, that desquamative rash. So if you've ever gotten a blister, and when that blister kind of goes away, the skin sort of peels away, that's just desquamation. So this desquamative rash is the toxin attacking the, uh, the lining of the skin, and that's what you get in toxic shock syndrome. So remember uh, the desquamative rash with toxic shock syndrome. Okay, Q fever is something that is uh, an occupational disease. So you're going to have another dead giveaway on the USMLE, but you need to know what that dead giveaway is. So Q fever is a chronic illness that manifests in a lot of different ways, but it's universally associated with exposure to cattle, sheep, and goats. So this could be like veterinarians, this could be farmers, this could be, um, you know, what, whatever profession deals with uh, cattle, sheep, and goats. And it's actually not the cattle, sheep, and goat that cause the Q fever, it's the placenta. Uh, so if you're dealing with pregnant and delivering sheep and goats. I mean, I, I don't know who does that, but I mean, clearly there are people out there who do this for an occupation. So exposure to cattle, sheep, and goat placenta is uh, a risk factor for Q fever. And it's always the people who have Q fever will have this risk factor. The symptoms are going to be rather nonspecific, a flu-like syndrome, non-productive cough, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly. Uh, but what you're going to have in the stem of the question in the patient's history is this occupational exposure to cattle, sheep, and goat placenta. The diagnosis is going to be pretty much, uh, well, you're going to get serology. That's going to be the best and most accurate way to diagnose Q fever. Uh, but you're not going to get serology unless you know that this patient has occupational exposure and the patient has the symptoms. So if they come in with these symptoms and you know that they have this kind of ex this occupational exposure to these animals, then you can go ahead and get serology. And when the serology comes back positive, the treatment is going to be doxycycline. It always seems that doxycycline is how you treat pretty much any of these sort of peripheral pathogens. Q fever, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, Lyme disease, and so forth. So doxycycline is the treatment for Q fever. Rocky Mountain spotted fever is a tick-borne illness that's seen in the Midwest and on the East Coast, particularly on the uh, Mid-Atlantic Coast, so like North Carolina or Virginia. The culprit here is rickettsia rickettsii, 
And this tends to present in the spring, summer, and early fall months. And that's very similar to Lyme disease. The history is an outdoor exposure uh, or camping. So these patients tend to be outside or, um, or out in the woods. Not all patients will remember the tick. So tick exposure is not something that, uh, that rules in or rules out uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Certainly, if they have been exposed to a tick, then that definitely heightens your suspicion. So the symptoms here are going to be a high fever and a headache. Now, fever and headache are very common, but a centripetal maculopapular rash is not very common. So the way we diagnose this is with serology when we're thinking Rocky Mountain spotted fever. However, some patients come in and they've got a fever, a headache, and meningeal symptoms. So depending on how the patient presents, you are going to be basing your diagnosis differently. So you're really only going to jump right to serology when the patient has this maculopapular rash. Because the maculopapular rash, uh, the centripetal maculopapular rash, I should say, centripetal is very important here, that's more specific to Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, but you might not necessarily see that. So Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever should always be on your differential, but the centripetal maculopapular rash, when it's given to you on a, on a test question, that should make you think Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is our presumptive diagnosis. And so in that case, you're going to get serology, which is the best initial and most accurate test when the patient has the centripetal maculopapular rash. Sometimes the patient can have confusion, dizziness, and meningeal symptoms. That simply just signifies that this is a more severe disease, and so you're going to have to, uh, you're going to, have to treat this more emergently. The treatment here is going to be doxycycline. Now, I want to highlight here that what this has in common with, uh, with Lyme disease is that you have fever, headache, uh, possibly arthralgias, and a rash. What this has separately is that with uh, Lyme disease, you don't have a centripetal rash. You have erythema migrans. And with Lyme disease, you do not treat all patients with doxycycline. In Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, we treat everybody with doxycycline. Remember back to Lyme disease, you treat patients who are above age 8 with doxycycline, and you would, will treat patients that are age 8 or younger, or under the age of 8, with amoxicillin. And the reason is we prefer not to use doxycycline in patients who are under age 8. In Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, you must, must, must always, always, always use doxycycline, regardless of the patient's age. And so that's something that the USMLE likes to throw out there. A five-year-old who's got a very clear picture of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, but what they're more concerned about is whether you know, not that you know how to diagnose Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, but that you know you need to give that five-year-old doxycycline uh, if you uh, diagnose Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. So Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is the great imitator, and the reason is because a lot of times it's confused with other diseases. So one of them is secondary syphilis. So secondary syphilis also has a very similar appearing rash on the hands and feet, but in syphilis, the fever and headache are less likely to be present. So secondary syphilis, you tend to just have that rash. Fever and definitely headache are less likely to be uh, concomitant with, with that rash. With Lyme disease, you're also going to have a fever and a headache, but with Lyme disease, the rash is going to be target shaped and it's not going to be centripetal. Usually it shows up on the abdomen, on the trunk, on the shoulders first. And then meningitis also has a fever and a headache, but meningitis tends to be more acute and the rash is less common. And with uh, meningococcal meningitis, you will have a rash, but that rash will not be centripetal. So this is a centripetal rash. It starts like this here on the left where you've got this maculopapular rash. And it starts on the extremities. So that's the reason why it can be confused with secondary syphilis. And eventually it spreads to the trunk. And so centripetal just means center seeking. 
All right, so tetanus. This is a life-threatening disease. So this infection can kill you, and this comes from a very predictable source. So this is going to be a patient that has a wound. Usually they got it outside. They may have stepped on a rusty nail. They may have gotten into a car accident, gotten some kind of cut or, or laceration, and then were inevitably exposed to dirt or, uh, or the road. Uh, this bacteria, Clostridium tetany, is a gram-positive bacteria, and it is omnipresent in the soil. So this comes from dirty wounds. Uh, it can also come from penetrating trauma. So, like I said, the classic example would be like stepping on a nail. This develops over a week. So this is, this, these patients are not going to come in with a brand new wound and have symptoms of tetanus. That does not happen. The history is going to give you the hint that the patient might have this myospasm, stiff muscles, etc. And you look at their history or you ask the patient and, yes, indeed, I uh, stepped on a rusty nail or I got this cut and... I have not gotten my tetanus vaccine, or I don't know if I've gotten my tetanus vaccine. That's the classic way this presents. The symptoms will start to appear over uh, a few days, uh, up to a week, and they start out with sort of uh, flu-like symptoms almost, minus the fever. Uh, so sort of irritability, myalgia, muscle stiffness. Uh, ultimately, though, these muscle symptoms are going to progress uh, into a state where they uh, have limited range of motion. They're usually in a sort of a fixed position, fixed flexion. So look for uh, wrists flexed, elbows flexed. Um, also, they can get lock jaw, so that's particularly affecting uh, their, their jaw muscles and facial muscles, and then ultimately respiratory arrest. So to diagnose, if you have a clinical presentation consistent with tetanus, uh, then you want to get serology. That's the best initial test, and it is the most accurate test. So serology to diagnose tetanus, and that will give you your, uh, your, your definitive diagnosis. To treat these patients, if they are in respiratory arrest or respiratory failure, then of course you want to intubate them. If they appear fine, then at the very least you want to uh, do respiratory monitoring. So make sure that they're hooked up to a machine so that you know that they are breathing while you're treating them while they're in the hospital. And you, of course, want to monitor them uh, very closely. You're going to be giving them uh, two very critical components of therapy. So you will give them tetanus immunoglobulin, and that is going to give them a temporary, quote-unquote, immunity to the tetanus. So that's going to do what their immune system can't do because they haven't been vaccinated. So you give them the tetanus immunoglobulin, but you also, in addition to that, have to give them an antibiotic. So we use an antibiotic that is uh, that covers gram-positive anaerobes, uh, which is what Clostridium tetany is. And the old recommendation used to be benzathine penicillin. The World Health Organization within the last few years have updated their recommendations, and now the recommendation is to use metronidazole. Uh, but you can still use benzathine penicillin if that's the only thing you have available. Uh, but metronidazole is the best treatment for tetanus. In addition to these two things, you should also give them a benzodiazepine. The benzodiazepine will be very useful for these symptoms, uh, so myospasm, myalgia, and so forth. Uh, however, if the patient is not intubated, you do need to be somewhat concerned about the possibility of respiratory depression. Um, so, again, it just uh, it just highlights the need for uh, for close respiratory monitoring, and don't be afraid to intubate if necessary, because respiratory arrest is how these people end up dying. Once the patient is uh, on the mend, they should be vaccinated because the tetanus immunoglobulin is just sort of a transient immunity, so that's not going to confer immunity uh, for the 10 years like the vaccine will. So you should vaccinate these patients uh, after uh, they've been treated. So if, before you discharge them from the hospital, you should vaccinate them. And the guidelines, as you probably know, is that everybody should get a tetanus shot every 10 years for prophylaxis. This is a very preventable disease.
does not need to happen, and in many cases it doesn't happen because we have uh, the vaccine. It's, this used to be a lot more common uh, back in like the Civil War, World War I, people used to die from tetanus quite frequently. Now we really don't see this that much in the U.S. So what we see in trauma is a tetanus-prone wound. Now, a tetanus-prone wound is any wound that could theoretically cause tetanus, regardless of whether the patient presently has symptoms or not. So those kinds of wounds can be wounds contaminated with dirt or feces, saliva, soil, or any animal bites, burns, frostbite, puncture wounds. So a lot of different kinds of wounds. Really, you should presume that any kind of wound uh, in trauma is tetanus prone unless clearly shown to be otherwise. And what you do is you just simply review their vaccination history. Most patients in the U.S. are vaccinated, but you got to still review their vaccination history anyway. So if they come in with one of these wounds, or really any wound until proven otherwise, you should check to see if they've been immunized. If you have record that they have, or the patient tells you that they have been immunized within the last five years, you do not need to give them vaccination, nor do you need to give them tetanus immune globulin. If it's been more than five years, uh, but less than 10 years that they've been immunized, then you're going to give them the vaccination right here and now. But you do not need to give them tetanus immune globulin. If they haven't been immune, or immunized in the last 10 years or they don't know, then you're going to give them the vaccination right now and you're going to give them the tetanus immune globulin right now. And the reason we do this is because, remember, tetanus takes about seven, week, or seven days to come on. So they may come in from, uh, w with their wound. They're not going to have tetanus right now because it takes a while. But seven days later, they can get the tetanus. So if we give them the vaccination and tetanus immune globulin, then that will actually prevent, prevent that from happening. All right, other viral infections. Uh, so we're going to talk about Kaposi sarcoma and dengue fever. So Kaposi sarcoma is a dermatologic malignancy that's seen most commonly, and I would say in the U.S. exclusively in patients with HIV and AIDS. And this has a rather aggressive course. So the culprit here is herpes virus, uh, human herpes virus 8. And you should know that for the USMLE, that this is causative for Kaposi sarcoma. The symptoms here are cutaneous lesions, and when you see them, you'll never forget them. These are deep red, violaceous, palpable, three-dimensional, but plaque-like uh, lesions on the skin. And they initially come up on the face and lower extremities, particularly the soles of the feet. And they can also happen on mucous membranes. They can happen internally. They can be in your GI system. They can be on your stomach. They can be in your intestine. But usually those are asymptomatic. They can be in your lungs. They can be in your bronchi. They can be, they can be pretty much anywhere. Um, usually, though, they don't happen in the brain. That's the only place where they don't show up. Uh, but internally, they tend to be asymptomatic. Where they are symptomatic, though, is on the, uh, on the mucous membranes and on the skin. They are pretty painful. So the diagnosis is going to be biopsy. That's the only way to diagnose Kaposi sarcoma. So any patient who has HIV, AIDS, who has these kinds of lesions showing up on their skin, they should absolutely be getting a biopsy of these lesions because this is so widespread in patients with advanced HIV and AIDS. The treatment is going to be simply compliance with uh, heart. That's the, if you haven't watched the HIV AIDS lecture, that's highly active antiretroviral therapy. So that's just their antiretrovirals that they take for HIV and AIDS. A lot of patients that get Kaposi sarcoma uh, are, are non-compliant with their medication or they're not on medication. So uh, compliance with heart is our first treatment. Interferon alpha can also be useful for Kaposi sarcoma and various chemotherapeutics, uh, particularly the vinca alkaloids are used, but you don't need to worry about that. So compliance with heart and interferon alpha are the mainstay of therapy for Kaposi sarcoma. This is what it looks like. Uh, 
So these are these kinds of lesions, if you see these on an HIV AIDS patient, that should immediately set off your suspicion, your presumptive diagnosis for Kaposi sarcoma, and you're gonna be getting a biopsy of these lesions. And when the histology comes back, that'll confirm your diagnosis. Okay, dang fever. So I struggled on whether or not I wanted to put this in here because this doesn't happen very frequently in the US, but it can happen in the US. So I did put it in anyway. Uh, and it can also happen in Americans that travel abroad. So this is most seen equatorially. So in like Brazil or Mexico or the Caribbean, uh, Central America, Southeastern Asia. Uh, but it can be seen in the extreme southern U.S. It can be seen in, uh, particularly in southern Texas. So the culprit here is dengue virus, and the symptoms are, again, flu-like symptoms, but it's specifically noted by these extreme myalgias, arthralgias, and bony pain. And remember, uh, if you remember back to your second year of medical school when you learned about all these zebra diseases, um, dang fever is actually known as breakbone fever. So the myalgias and the bony pain are very prominent. And another thing that you see characteristically with dang fever, but not in all cases, is this characteristic modeling rash. And what modeling is, is it's like a morbilliform rash. It's kind of that lacy red uh, uh, rash. I'll show you what it looks like. It's kind of hard to describe. Right, so diagnosis is going to be based on labs and symptoms. So there's really no, there's really no specific serology that we use for dang fever. It's going to be based on how our labs look and what the symptoms are, and particularly that the patient is in or has been in a, an endemic area. So hyponatremia is one thing that's very common in patients with dang fever. And then around day six to seven of the disease, uh, after they started developing the initial flu-like symptoms, thrombocytopenia and neutropenia can be seen. So a low platelet count and a low white blood cell count. But that's really not consequential. Uh, you're not really going to worry about having to transfuse the patient or the patient coming out with any kind of... Uh, of, of disease secondary to the neutropenia. That's just something you see in dang fever. Elevated liver enzymes can be present and pleural effusion may be noted on uh, chest x-ray. There are specific serology tests and so technically that would be the most accurate test, but again this tends to be diagnosed uh, with the labs and the symptoms rather than with a, a, an actual serology test. The treatment is going to be supportive. Uh, dang fever is, is uh, self-limited, so you don't really need to be giving any kind of antivirals or, or any therapy other than uh, treating the pain and the fever and replacing fluid as necessary. All of these patients, however, should be monitored inpatient. Oops. So here's that modeling sort of lacy like rash. Sometimes you can see this in your hands or some people can see this in their hands sometimes when they get cold. So this is the rash you see in dang fever. It's not palpable. The, the skin will feel normal, uh, but you, you, you see this sort of modeling going on. Okay, so parasitic infections, we're gonna talk about babesiosis and enterobiasis. So babesiosis is a tick-borne illness that resembles malaria, but it can happen in the U.S. So that's what sets it apart from malaria. Patients don't get patients in the U.S. don't get malaria unless they've been traveling, but you can get babesiosis, and that looks like malaria. Now babesiosis is carried by the exodes tick, and where do we also see the exodes tick? We see it in Lyme's disease. So patients with Lyme's disease. If they have confirmed Lyme's disease, you should also be thinking, does this patient also have babesiosis? Because sometimes you can get bit by a tick that's carrying both Lyme's disease and they're carrying babesiosis. So these two can happen together. Uh, and But this pathogen, unlike Lyme's disease, this pathogen infects the red blood cells. So the culprit, culprit here is babesia, 
And the symptoms are going to be flu-like symptoms, chills and sweating, hepatomegaly, and possibly symptoms consistent with Lyme's disease if they're co-infected. So really these are rather non-specific symptoms, but where you're going to tend to make the diagnosis is on your labs. So if you have a patient that's got these flu-like symptoms and chills and sweating, and they have labs consistent with hemolytic anemia, or let's say they've got Lyme's disease and they've got labs consistent with hemolytic anemia, then you're gonna to wanna to think about babesiosis because hemolytic anemia is rather specific to babesiosis uh, as far as infectious diseases and as far as uh, patients that present acutely with flu-like symptoms, chills and sweating and so forth. So what do we see lab-wise in hemolytic anemia? Well, what, what, what happens in hemolytic anemia? Your red blood cells are blowing up. So when that happens, you're gonna have an elevated indirect bilirubin. You're gonna have a reduced haptoglobin. You're gonna have an elevated LDH and a, uh, liver enzymes can also be elevated. So symptoms consistent with hemolytic anemia. The treatment is going to be admission and for therapy, we use IV clindamycin and PO quinine. So this is what the red blood cells actually look like. You don't need to worry about any kind of microscopy or slides like this or anything, but uh, it's good to know that looking at the red blood cells is how we diagnose babesiosis. All right, let's finish up with enterobiasis. So enterobiasis is also parasitic, but this is a homothic infection, meaning that uh, it's not due to an amoeba, it's due to a worm, uh, and it infects the large intestine. And generally this is manifested as anal pruritus, and usually on the USMLE when you get enterobiasis, uh, it'll generally be a patient who's a child. So the culprit here is Enterobius vermicularis, and the symptoms are anal pruritus. This worm can actually uh, manifest up into the vagina, so it can cause vaginal pruritus in, in girls and women, and insomnia. And that's just secondary to the fact that this worm actually lays its eggs while you're sleeping. And so the worm actually comes, it's really gross, but it comes out your anus and lays its eggs and it can go all the way up to your vagina, and this causes itching in the middle of the night. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of gross, but that's why it can cause insomnia. On physical exam, you may note perianal redness, and that's just due to the chronic itching. Diagnosis is really old-fashioned. What you're doing is you're going to just take some tape, and you're gonna rub it around the perianal area, and then you're going to put that on a slide and uh, check for eggs. And that's pretty much it. That's how you diagnose it. It's pretty much the same way it was done 100 years ago. And this is the best initial test and the most accurate test available. Once you've confirmed the diagnosis, you're going to treat the patient with albendazole, and that's effective against uh, helminths. And you're also going to want to treat family members. And that is the end of our other infections.